Welcome everyone to this new episode of My Generation with Ines. This is Ines and I have with me Heide Mukshow. Uh, for the first time I'm doing a physical episode, so bear the, let's say, logistics because we had to improvise. Uh, hi, them. I'm, we are right now in Tunis, by the way, we are in the DOT, which is like a, a hub for a lot of startups and accelerators. And hi, them ha- happened to be the CEO of REITS. He will tell us more about it. So hi, them, can you introduce yourself a bit to our sure. audience? Um, hi, everyone. So it's the first time she's doing it physically, it's the first time I'm doing it in English, so bear with me. Um, so yeah, my name is Haytham, uh, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of REITS. Um, so I've got a business background, so I studied at MSB here in Tunis, and then I got uh, a scholarship to study in the US, it's the mm-hmm. Thomas Jefferson Scholarship. Yeah. So I studied there in Kansas, and then afterwards I had the opportunity to go to France, where I where I worked in a, in a startup, and then I chose to to come back to Tunis to launch my own business. What and it's sweet. <coughs> so what kind of um, startup you worked in in Spurs? So it's called Mobius. It's, uh, it's an AI startup basically. And it was in, a, in its early stage. Um, so they were looking to, to develop an AI solution, uh, which is a no-code solution, allowing people to be able to have like uh, software without, without code. So, All yeah. right. So you went back to Tunis which year? It was in 2017. Okay. Um, so initially, I thought of studying Chinese and doing master uh, in China. Uh-huh. Um, so I was like in the phase of exploring the world and Why just China? to know. It's because uh, in my mind, I discovered the West and I needed to discover the Eastern part uh-huh. so yeah. that I have like full scope of how the world works. Yeah. And then, uh, so I studied Chinese. I started to study Chinese, and also I love Chinese food. So it was also a reason. Yeah, yeah. So when I when I was in Paris, like I was eating always Chinese food. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, I started studying Chinese and like eyeing some universities there, and yeah. then, uh, and it, then it hit me like, okay, so what if I do a master degree there? What do I want to do in life? Mm-hmm. I always knew it was entrepreneurship. All right. So I had the question of why not starting now, and then. The answer was, uh, I feared that, like I was really scared. Okay, um, so you're right now CEO of Reed. So you start in 2017, Reed. Uh, not really. Okay. So it's a long journey. Like, All right. So know, maybe uh, let's start by the, the, telling what is Reed, what does okay. it do, and why the choice of Reed? Like why the choice of uh, that kind sure. of business? Yeah. So Reed is a mobile app offering yeah. audiobook summaries in Arabic. It's 20 minutes long, mm-hmm. and what we do is. We take like the international bestsellers and condense them in 20 minutes. Um, so you could listen to them like while commuting or while working out, etc. Yeah. And also it has podcasts and we'll be having this podcast on Reads as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and the goal was to be a gateway for people, for non-English speakers to mm-hmm. have access to those ideas that we only find in English books. Uh, because I personally and my co-founder as well, we learned a lot from, from English books and we found that like to be ashamed that a lot of this knowledge is not actually accessible mm-hmm. for people who don't speak English. And you're talking about non-fiction books for it's uh, mostly non- yeah, yeah, definitely non-fiction books. Yeah. Um, so you so you started, um, so maybe you can tell us um, in that after deciding of going for China and then you didn't do it. Yeah. Uh, what may, what was the thought process to decide to go um, full time on a startup with your co-founder? Okay. You know, living together, yeah, having sure. the whole journey. Uh, yes. Um, so I didn't meet you here back then. I met him like two years ago. Mm-hmm. But in two thousand seventeen, I read that quote that says, uh, "When it feels scary to jump, that's when you need to jump." Mm-hmm. And I felt felt scared, like uh, launching my own business. Uh, I was I was 26, 25 mm-hmm. back then, and I thought I was too young. Uh, culturally, you don't really launch a business at 25, maybe. But then I read a lot of um, biographies, and then I found out that those who made it actually started a bit early. Like, it's not a rule, but many of those who start early um, made it. So I was like, yeah, if people can make it at that age, then why not me? So. Mm-hmm. And it becomes it's become more and more normalized to start early, especially here in Tunis, which was not the case before. Mm. Because we do have success stories here at a young age, so 
So yeah, I decided to go for it, pretty much. So it wasn't trades at the beginning. Uh, the entrepreneurial journey takes a lot of iterations. So this is reads is my my third iteration, I guess. What was this the fourth, fourth iteration? Oh. So I wanted to launch a business, but I didn't know what to do and what business I wanted to launch. So you just go with the first idea that comes to your mind. What was the first idea? Uh, so I worked as an intern for a startup here in Tunis, and like previously, and I've been working on a project involving like a Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, yeah, it's called hotspot. Mm -hmm. You know when you go to to like McDonald's or or somewhere in the airport where you ha you have to go through uh, connecting through a portal to have access to Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. like in the airport. You have to put in your credentials. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so I wanted to do a solution like this in Tunis, where when you go to a coffee shop, you have to to give up uh, your 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 credentials so that you have access to Wi-Fi, and it's a lot of data for 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 the owners of the coffee shop. Okay. And then yeah, and I found out later that there's no big market for it here in Tunis, so mm -hmm. so I learned that the hard way. And then after that, I thought, okay, so this is not working. What should I do then? Yeah. Uh, well, what am I passionate about? So yeah, it's books. Can I? find a solution to books here. Is mm -hmm. there a problem to related to books in Tunis? And of course, there's a lot of problems. So there's the accessibility, there's the price, there's many problems. And I had to pick like which problem I wanted to fix. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then Kitab was launched. Kitab is a book marketplace for uh, secondhand books. So they use books. If you have books at home and that you don't want to like Okay. That's one of your iterations. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I it's didn't know the that. One previous, yeah, to this one. Okay. So it's a book marketplace, pretty much. If you have books at home and that you don't need anymore, you just take pictures of them and then you upload them on on the marketplace. Okay. And then once someone buys them, a delivery guy comes pick them up, and then you get you get pretty much your money. Um, but the margins were too small. So it wasn't really viable, and we got uh, we got rejected by investors like a couple of times, and I knew that this was not going anywhere. So let's let's stop at that moment a sure. bit when you were failing, because yeah. I think a lot of people that they want to do a startup like it's they are in that stage, um, and then maybe that's when they take certain decisions. You like okay, I'm going to take a job now, or I'm gonna stop. So how was it with the family? Uh, at that moment, you were broke, I would suppose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm still broke. <laughs> uh, how was it like uh, handling it emotionally, mentally? It's it's a good point. Uh, I think I think one of the major things uh, a founder should do before starting a business is having the right expectations. Mm -hmm. So now, when we look at success stories, for example, we'll only look at the bright side of the success stories because it's a condensed format. For example, if a successful founder goes to a radio and mm -hmm. they have like five minutes to tell about their stories, they're gonna skip the parts where they failed. Mm -hmm. So they're only gonna talk about those parts where they succeeded. So you think that that founder actually like nailed it in the first time, but when you dig deeper, you'll find that there was many iterations before. Mm -hmm. And it happened with, with, with many international success stories for example but what about you the founder of nike's oh uh, we're still not in the that, success story but yeah yeah i mean in, in that process. in that phase in but this in, process in, in that process how are you handling things mentally i was expecting that so okay. that's that made it easier so i had the right expectation so i knew that it was just an iteration and i needed to iterate if it didn't work out so i gave myself like four years span to find the right model Okay. So by having the right expectations, you could actually accept way more failures than, than you would accept if you thought you would make it just from the first try. But you still gave yourself four years. Yeah, I gave myself four years. And that's why I started earlier, actually. Are you in that still in those four years, or are you? Uh, yeah, almost, actually. I'm finishing those four years uh, this, this year. So, so yeah, I started in, uh, when I was 26, and okay. I'm almost 30. So. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I I think I'm I'm pretty confident this is the right iteration actually. So yeah, we had a lot of validation for it and it's it's growing very fast. So Good. yeah. All right. Um. So now you you're you're feeling confident about this iteration, right? Um. 
like I'm going back to that same question but differently. Sure. You're saying like you're still broke right now. Yeah, I was joking, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> okay, that's good. Almost. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> but like how? Um, um, because I think a lot of us like they fall into the comparison, and we all we we all do. We all did at a certain point. Um, do you, when you when you have those moments where you question your own journey, um, how do you like? Um, uh, stand up for yourself it's, again. It's a really good point. Um, so if you're confident enough that you're just delaying your gratification and that there's a bigger price at the end of the journey, then you'll be able to handle those comparisons. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> part of being a founder is having the right mindset. And having a right mindset means uh, giving up many bad reflexes like comparing yourself to others. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty special journey being a founder, it's a very hectic one, so so having the right mindset is, is really important. Mm -hmm. So we avoid, of course, uh, comparing ourselves to others, especially those who are our ages and who are like having successful careers, having good salaries, for example, mm -hmm. but you could still compensate with your net worth, pretty much, if you think about it in terms of equity. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good way to say yeah. it. Um, so regarding comparison, but this time I will not uh, tackle it from like a personal you compare yourself to others, but if you would compare, uh, do you ever fall into comparing um, starting a business here versus starting a business somewhere else uh, and that dilemma uh, as a Tunisian young entrepreneur, what does that bring to your mind? It's also a good point. Um, what I could say though is that there are, there are advantages here that sometimes we overlook. And there are a lot of disadvantages, of course. One of the advantages someone can have when starting a business here, for example, is, I don't know if you're living with your family here, mm -hmm. you don't have to pay rent. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are some advantages. Even like on the legal side with the Startup uh, Act, mm -hmm. uh, it helps a lot. So for example, me and my co-founder, we had, we had the uh, this scholarship, it's Bourse. So yeah. pretty much like the government gives you a monthly stipend mm. and it helps you survive. Yeah. So there are some advantages that you have to acknowledge, but there are also a lot of disadvantages. Yeah. Like if you want to get investors, they might not really trust the legal system here. Or there's a lot of disadvantages when it comes to currency, for example. Uh, you cannot, yeah, you cannot, uh, like you cannot convert the dinars to, to, to euros or, or dollars as you wish. Yeah. <clears throat> and those are actually some barriers that we have to think of when starting a business here, especially when you want to grow and we want to expand in other markets. Which you did with REITs, uh, right? Yes, uh, actually present in many countries, but it's quite simple when it comes to mobile apps. So it's simpler to scale uh, compared to other businesses. Mm -hmm. So yes, we're pretty much present in, in all MENA countries. Uh, we have like paying customers from different countries as well. But it's still a challenge uh, to grow uh, because you need to be incorporated somewhere else where investors could trust enough uh, the legal system to put uh, bigger amounts of money. So. Yeah. Yeah. And regarding reads, like eventually the, your final iteration was into the realm of audiobooks and podcasts, mm, etc. Yes. Um, what are the discoveries that you found out maybe? Uh, especially that you're doing it in Arabic, uh, targeted to the MENA region. So what discoveries or what did you learn about this uh, industry? Um, I actually discovered a lot about the Tunisian market. Um, mm -hmm. I still believe that we tend to be a little bit pessimistic as Tunisians. Um, mm. We tend to underestimate ourselves as well. So if I get a dollar for every time they told me we don't have a market here, that Tunisians don't read, that Tunisians are not interested in those kind of content, yeah. uh, that Tunisians, that all, only like food businesses work and Tunisians want to eat only and all those like narratives yeah. that are not really helpful for us as Tunisians. I think those are just wrong narratives. So mm. what, what I discovered is that Tunisians, if you give them a good product where it helps them improve, Mm. to help them like be better with a good pricing yeah they would definitely pay for it yeah so i think we should um, be kinder to us as tunisians honestly i agree yeah because like it goes both ways right there is not only the tunisian but there is also the system and the businesses 
So like if you say they're only good, like food businesses only are good and businesses or what they can think of is food, of course the Tunisian will not see another product or another uh, side exactly. of things. So I do agree. It's like, it's like self-fulfilling prophecy. So, mm-hmm. so if you say that there's only food, then people will only launch food businesses and then you'll have many food businesses competing and then each one of them like improving their services and then you end up with a market full of food, which is good food. Mm. Um, so yeah. One of the advantages is that we have great food here in Tunis. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what do you think your own food of thought like that that changed uh, or ignited like um, this will to start a startup to to read? Was it like your exchange in the U.S.? Was it the internship in France? Um, was it Tunisians that you met here? So it's a good point. I don't know. Like when I, when looking back, I don't know at what stage I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but there was a bit of luck in it. Uh, I didn't expect myself to end up in the business school first. And then once I joined the business school, uh, we did like a, a competition for entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And I really liked it. Um, so I was like digging deeper into entrepreneurship and I read a lot of biographies. And there was some quotes that, that actually triggered the thinking process of, of being an entrepreneur. So when you look around, you just find out that everything was built about entrepreneurs and by entrepreneurs. Yeah. And then once you're convinced that they're not, they're not really smarter than you, then you start <coughs> thinking of the ways you could actually have your own mark in this world. So Yeah. And um, we were talking the other day as well. Um, I, like, because <laughs> a lot of my friends as well and like young people, uh, there is this pressure, right? You to be an entrepreneur, escape the rat race, you know, the nine to five, and they and they like portraying entrepreneurship as the ultimate happiness and the ultimate fulfillment and purpose in life, Allah. So, are you happy, fulfilled with the full purpose it's, right it's, now? It's a good question. Depends on the days, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, but it's really fulfilling, honestly. Uh, I was talking about that with my co-founder the the other day, and only seeing like the map where your product is being used and you see the North African map lighting up yeah. is very fulfilling. Um, and it compensates for those bad days where you just, you're just struggling to go through the day. Um, so yeah, it is fulfilling, especially when you're passionate about it. Yeah. So there are a lot of people that are doing it for the money, mm-hmm. uh, just to escape the rat race. Mm-hmm. And it's not a good reason to start your own company. Uh, because you need to know your why and you need to have a conviction that uh, that exceeds uh, the money aspect and the financial aspects of it mm-hmm. even though it's the financial aspect is really good as well if if if, if you make it happen but, but. how does that play in your like self identification identification like do you identify yourself as I am an entrepreneur or do you like separate what so you do from it's, uh, it's a good point as well um, so there was a lot of imposter syndrome at the beginning, uh, so I had to deal with that. And it's something that every entrepreneur has to go through, I guess. Uh, so yeah, once you have to sign like the first check, or the f- sign the first shareholder agreement. I remember like when I got my first uh, check and I needed to sign it, I didn't even have like a fixed signature, so I had to train and and like practice my signature the yeah. entire day before and I had like a whole paper of me <laughs> signing so that I have a consistent signature with the bank. And once you do that and then you find that you need to sign for something where you're a CEO or you're like yeah. a représentant legal, like a yeah. legal representative of the, yeah. of the thing and you don't even have a consistent signature, then you start wondering like, am I good enough for this? So Okay. So yeah, definitely. There's a lot of imposter syndrome at the beginning and then you get used to it. And actually, imposter syndrome is, 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 is actually good. It's a good signal that you're actually doing things beyond your capabilities first. So you're actually climbing the ladder and you need to grow with, with, with your position each time. But do you identify yourself as an entrepreneur? Now, now definitely, yeah. It's in my DNA now. Mm-hmm. So what if, what if like this entrepreneurship thing ends? Like, how does that... How does that, you think, will affect, like, who you are as a person? Um, what do you mean by end? Like, if, if there was no entrepreneurship in, uh, as a choice in your life, for example, as what you do, like, if it's not that, if it's not that who you are, um, 
how do you see maybe yourself or do you think that will affect a lot like is it that present in who you are as a person I actually I couldn't picture myself doing anything else to be honest um, maybe after doing the exit uh, there is actually a natural path for entrepreneurs to be first entrepreneurs and then investors and then maybe launch their own VC so I'm, I'm eyeing this path but uh, I, I couldn't see myself doing anything else besides entrepreneurship at this stage of my life, definitely. Mm -hmm. So for someone who's listening, who's having like uh, either in his, uh, let's say he did not find that iteration that mm -hmm. is there or thinking of it, um, what, I, I wouldn't say like, because uh, I believe everyone has their own um, journeys and reasons, etc. Well. and timelines, yeah. exactly. But uh, what do you think like, you would say something you need to be mindful of that you that is like the, the other side of the iceberg that we don't see uh, for those who just want to escape the nine to five uh, I don't think it's a it's a valid reason to be an entrepreneur um, there are a lot of amazing jobs that are nine to five and there are a lot of successful people that are doing nine to five as well yeah. so as long as you love what you're doing then uh, to me you're not to me but you're you're successful because at the end of the day being happy is what matters because if we stick to those definition of being successful which is having money having a lot of money and then you're not happy with what you do then you're not really successful because at the end of the day i think success is happiness so being yeah. fulfilled with what you do and with who you are yeah. do you believe that success yeah. is happiness yeah definitely <laughs> i'm i might be overly optimistic but yeah yeah it sounds like fairy tale, but yeah, definitely, yeah, I'm, I'm convinced. Yeah, because I was not, I was not, I thought success was surviving and being rich uh, mm -hmm. back then, but now I got to meet many people who are very successful using those normal standards, meaning they have a lot of money, but they still have a void inside and they're not happy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I um, in, in the last, like, um, I would say one to two years, that kind of concept for me changed and it's not uh, like for me it's uh, it's meaning more than happiness because like um, I started to believe that it's uh, more of a um, momentary you know like it's uh, happiness comes and go at the same time but meaning it's more consistent depends on how you define happiness <coughs> so there's a lot of definition and those are all of them are labels mm -hmm. but happiness is not like the dopamine rush of of being at a party. <laughs> Happiness to me is just being at peace with yourself and being satisfied with who you are and mm. content. Yeah. So that's happiness. It's yeah. not like just turning up and partying, yeah. etc. Yeah, that's yeah, nice. Yeah, it's definitely. So meaning gives happiness and happiness gives meaning and it's all interconnected and interrelated, yeah. definitely. Um, so my last question, before the last question, I would sure. say, um, I know that you're uh, a big uh, fan of Nava. Yeah, sure. So I wanted to know which are other like, uh, um, thinkers. let's say, thinkers that yeah. uh, they fuel your <laughs> mindset. Naval Rafi. Actually, I downloaded the Naval's mind. I'll I'll share it with you. It's a whole Google Drive of what Naval said. Like it's it's, it's amazing. And like uh, tweet storms that are amazing. Uh, like on how to build wealth, etc. Mm -hmm. So I've had many virtual mentors along the way. Uh, so I've listened to Tim Ferriss a lot, and they're actually friends, like Tim Ferriss and Nabal. Mm -hmm. uh, and at each stage of my life, I've had someone who's been mentoring me. Uh, so yeah, Tim Ferriss is definitely someone who's who's had uh, a lot of influence, uh, and many different people. Um, each one of them related to some area of of my life. So. But you do have like the support system physically as well. Um, or mentors? Yeah, sure. There's there are a lot of local mentors as well. Definitely yeah. is. Yeah, and definitely I think like it's important also family and friends. Yeah, yeah that's part of it. Yeah, yeah. clearly. Yeah. All right. Very last question is one perspective that you would like to challenge people about. Only one. Okay. <laughs> There's. It can be anything, not necessarily related to what you do or. It's it's, it's a good one because I think there's a lot to challenge. Uh, there's a lot of social constructs here in, in, in Tunis that are self-limiting, I think. Um, One eternity later. I think there is a tendency for us here uh, to pay a lot of attention to labels. 
I know people who've picked, for example, medical studies just to please their parents mm -hmm. uh, and they end up being not really happy. Mm -hmm. uh, and their parents wanted their kids to pick that st those studies just to say to their neighbors that their kids yeah. are studying uh, medicines. Yeah. It's just an example, but we've, we're seeing a lot of that where students or just people just doing things just to please others, whether it's their parents or their family. And I think that's the recipe to be unhappy in life. Um, so yeah, it's just a message for all the parents out there. Let your kids do the things that they enjoy in life, because that's what will make them happy at the end of the day, at the end of the, their life as well. So. Yeah, yeah. 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 Alright, thanks a lot, Haytham. It was great sure. having you, and thanks for being yeah, our first this. physical <laughs> in-person interview. Thanks a lot. Thanks for making me do an English podcast for the first time as well. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.